to me. Autonomy is that sense that I have a voice, uh, that, that my being here matters and I can help to shape the environment in which I work every day and the, and the way that we serve people. And then relationship. We all want to be respected. We all want to be connected with other people. We all want a place where we can belong. Uh, where we can love others and be loved by others. And, and so, you know, that kind of all rolls together in with that sense of purpose to really try to create an environment that, that people are pleased to come to work, that they feel that sense of ownership and a sense of pride in what they do every day. Welcome to the Better People Podcast. I'm Margaret Yurick, and in today's episode, we're talking to Steve Lindsay, CEO of Garden Spot Communities. So Steve, welcome. Thank you. It's uh, an honor and a privilege to be with you today. Well, I am thrilled to be able to have this opportunity to speak with you. So before we jump into the topic, I'd love for you to just share with our listeners a little bit about who you are, your background, and a little bit about Garden Spot Communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I am the CEO at Garden Spot Communities, which is a senior living organization that's based in Lancaster County, uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, we've got three different locations. We serve about 1,500 people and have about 850 staff. Uh, so it's a, a growing organization and uh, and a thriving organization, which is really exciting. On a personal note, um, I am a social worker by background. Uh, so I had this um, desire in college, I thought, to be a marriage and family therapist. And then uh, as I got out of college, I started working at a residential treatment center for adolescents who were court ordered into placement. I got my master's degree. I started doing family therapy and realized I wasn't as good at it as what I really felt like I needed to be. Uh, so I had an opportunity to move into the medical world to work at a rehab hospital and just lots of growth opportunities and, and, uh, and chances and, and opportunities that were afforded to me. Uh, to learn and grow. And I ended up uh, moving from the rehab hospital into senior living and really just found my niche, uh, found my passion for serving older adults and, and really thinking about how do we create opportunities for people to live with purpose, to live lives of vitality, uh, regardless of which season of life we find ourselves in. So that has really been a driving purpose and passion for us as we go through. I'm a husband, a father of two adult children, and uh, soon one grandchild. So we're really excited about that. So uh, looking forward to that time coming as well. Awesome. Well, thanks for that. Steve. Um, now, you've been with Garden Spot for 23 years, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a long and, time. Yeah, and, and in the CEO role that whole time. Yeah, I started as a 39-year-old uh, first-time CEO, mm -hmm. and um, they were willing to take a chance on me, and uh, it has been just a, a wonderful ride ever since. Yeah. Now, was that your first experience in the senior living community or had you worked at others prior? Yeah, I had been an executive director uh, at, a, at a much smaller uh, retirement community prior to coming here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you joined 23 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I know one of the things that we talked about was um, you join and you, one of the first things you noticed was the culture at Garden Spot at the time. I think it's safe to say it was not a good one. It was really right. challenged. Yeah. <laughs> so so tell me about that. Like what what did you see? What did you feel? How did you know that it wasn't a healthy culture? Yeah. Well, the first day that I started, um the previous CEO was here and uh in order to kind of get me acclimated, he was retiring and uh he had been with the organization 5 years. The, the organization was 5 years old at that point. And uh, and so there was a town hall meeting that day. And so he said to me, you know, I, I'll kind of handle this one and you can sit in the back and see how we do things around here. And I said, that's great. I love that opportunity. So I had my notebook. I sat in the back. But as soon as he got up and started to talk, there were boos and there were people shouting him down. And for the next hour, every time he opened his mouth, uh, you know, people were yelling. And I realized 
pretty quickly. You know, you don't have to be super sharp to realize that the culture is a little bit challenged in that situation. And so, um, you know, immediately after that, I realized, boy, we have some real work to do. And and so I pulled the management team together and 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 we started on what was a multi-year uh, effort to kind of shift that culture and turn that around. There was just at the time, uh, as I learned, uh, a lack of transparency, uh, a lack of trust uh, between the residents who lived here and the administration at the time, uh, not as much a focus on um, customer service as what should have been in place. And so we really worked on on uh, reformatting a lot of those things and, and driving into that sense of culture, which is what kind of makes everything happen in an organization like ours. Yeah. And so when we spoke the other day, you uh, shared with me that you took kind of this three prong approach with that, which I thought was really interesting and unique to your or to a, a, an organization like yours where you have residents. So you looked at it uh, from the standpoint of the culture for the residents and the culture for your employees, and then just creating that organizational culture. And I believe it was a, an innovative culture that you were really looking to, to strive yeah. for and create. So yeah. where'd that come from? And, and how, how did that work? Like, what did you do? Yeah, well, uh, pretty quickly, uh, one of the things I learned is that, uh, you know, kind of one of the fundamental aspects of being a CEO is that you have to build culture, you have to build competency in your organization, and you have to build community. And so uh, as I looked at it at the time, I saw culture kind of being in a couple different buckets. And so uh, you know, one of those was what was what was our resident culture and the people who live here, the people that we serve, what, what's the culture that we're creating for them and facilitating for them to live in? And then our workplace culture, you know, as our team members come to work every day, what's the culture that drives them? What, what informs them on the way that we do things around here? Uh, and then we knew that innovation was going to be a really key strategy for our future. And so how do we drive that into the DNA of the organization? So everybody's thinking about new ways to do things, better ways to respond to needs and, and uh, new opportunities that we can take advantage of. So if I were to ask you to share one example of something you did that helped to build, really create and build the culture that you uh, envisioned uh, for your residents. What what would a, a good example be of something that you did there? Yeah. One of the things we started to do um, was to shift uh, the conversation from what had been a fairly self-centered culture. Uh, and understandably, you know, people were concerned about whether they were getting their money's worth, you know, how were people listening to them? What was the response to their concerns? All those kind of things. And that drives you into very much a, a self-centered approach to life. And so we started as we started to respond to those things. We, we incorporated a number of different opportunities for transparency. Uh, we started uh, twice a month. We have what we call coffee and conversation meetings, which are ask me anything meetings. And so I go uh, oftentimes have, you know, another member or two of the leadership team and and uh, people can come and ask us anything they want, you know, about the way we're thinking about the future, about the way we're operating right now, about our personal lives, about politics, you know, whatever it is, we we talk about it there as transparently and as absolutely honestly as we possibly can. And so that gave an opportunity to begin to build a little bit of that trust, which which was really huge uh, as we went through. And then as we did, we started to incorporate opportunities for people to live other-centered lives instead of self-centered lives. And um, Peter Block is an author who has written um, a lot of books, actually. And he comes at it from this approach that we have developed a, a very much a consumer culture in our country, where it's all about us. It's all about what can we accumulate. It's all about you know, how am I taking care of my needs? And when we have issues and challenges, our approach is to purchase the solutions to those. And so as we uh, begin to go through life, you think about it, you know, if, if we want a good education for our kids, uh, we, we 
purchase, you know, a better school system. Yeah. Uh, if, if you want a safe community, you purchase a good police force. You know, if you want good medical care, you find a good doctor and, and pay for those services. Uh, but it it's all tends to be external to who we are as individuals. And Block makes the case, and I think does a really good job of that, that as we think about our life in community together, it's up to us to create the solutions to our, our future, to solutions to the, the challenges that we face. And so it takes that sense of other-centeredness where we shift the focus from ourselves onto those around us and the community we're living in. And we begin to think about how can we come together, not as consumers, but as citizens, and, and begin to uh, form the solutions, begin to make a difference in the lives around us. Uh, so we started talking about what could that look like and how could we make a difference and, and how could we live with a sense of purpose? Um, We've been doing some reading and, and learning around Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, uh, you know, uh, Viktor Frankl's man's search for meaning and that sense of, you know, that that we can weather a lot of storms in our life if we have a sense of purpose. And oftentimes that purpose comes from serving others, you know, from reaching out and, and sharing what we have with others. One of the fascinating things that we learned uh, in that that research that we were doing is that Maslow, and we're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs from, you know, our, our uh, Psych 101 class in college. Uh, but Maslow, in the last couple years of his life, actually added another level onto his hierarchy. And what he said was, as you come through life and you have this sort of inward journey that leads you to self-actualization, but what happens is when you arrive at that place where you have become a, the best version of yourself or maybe a, just a better version of yourself, there's this opportunity to turn and share yourself with the world around you, to connect with a, a purpose that's bigger than yourself and to make a difference, to make a dent in the universe. Uh, and, and so we started looking for opportunities and, and facilitating opportunities for our residents to make a dent in the universe around them. And, uh, and as they did, we started sharing their stories and, and telling stories and holding that up as examples. Uh, and so that, that aspect of storytelling became a, a big part of that. But it was all focused on that shift from self-centered lives to other-centered lives, to service-oriented lives, to loving others around us and, and sharing that love in practical ways. I remember, well, when we were talking the other day, what a, um, besides the fact that I just loved that whole story and, and it's so true and we really do need purpose. We feel better when we have a purpose and there are, you know, so many, uh, studies and, and out there about that and, and books that are being written. And I do want to come back to the Peter Block book to see if you remember what it was called, because I do have some of his, but I'm not sure I have the one you're referring to. But um, the whole idea, too, that you kind of shifted the thinking around what it is to be in a senior living community in that, you know, you you think that you're going to go to this, you know, as a resident coming in, right? I I put in my time. I've done the hard work. I I worked for years. And now it's my time to just sit back and relax and, and let everything be done for me. And yet really, to, as to, you know, to the point that you were just making, it doesn't really make it feel better. It's not really the, 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 the way to live that gives you the most joy. Yeah. I think. And, yeah. and yeah. And, and so you realize that and then help to create a community that would foster finding purpose. I just think that's really amazing. Yeah, it's really a, a fascinating journey because, you know, if you listen to all the voices in our culture, one of the things they tell you is that, you know, you work hard all your life and then you retire to live the good life, right? And so if you look at the images in, in advertisements and things, the good life looks like five days of golf a week, right, on a great golf course, or it looks like, you know, sitting hand in hand and watching the sun go down at the beach, you know, every day, you know, those kind of things. It, it, but it tends to be a more passive approach to life. And I think what we're learning um, is, is that that's really not the good life at all. 
uh, the life that brings the most joy, the life that brings the most happiness, the bright life that brings the most sense of fulfillment is a life of engagement and involvement. And this opportunity that we have to begin to harvest the wisdom of our lives and share that with future generations. Um, I had a fascinating opportunity a few years ago. I was uh, participating in a um, strategic planning uh, retreat with a, a nonprofit organization that's multinational. We were meeting up in Canada. And one of the fellows at my table was uh, Native American, and he did restorative justice work with First Nations people in Canada. And I had always been fascinated with this sense of, of culture in, in Native American uh, environments. And so I just spent hours, you know, when, whenever we had a break or whenever we had meal times or after it was done, kind of pestering poor Harley uh, with, with questions about culture. You know, what does it mean to be an, an elder? Uh, how do we become an elder? Is there a job description for being an elder? Is there, you know, a process, all this kind of stuff. And at one point he stopped me and he said, you know, something that really became one of those uh, kind of mind-blowing experiences for me. Uh, he said, you know, Steve, he said, you need to understand that not all people as they age become elders in our culture. He said, a lot of our people just get old and cranky in our culture the same way they do yours. Uh, those are not the elders, right? Uh, but the elders are the ones who take the time to learn the stories of our people, to harvest the wisdom of their own lives, and then to actively share that with future generations. Those are the elders that we really hold up in high regard. Those are the ones who lead us in our community, in, in our tribe, in our nation. And so as I thought about that, it, I realized that we have lost that sense in our modern day American culture, uh, where we have true elders that are in that process and encourage to harvest wisdom, to learn stories, to, to actively engage uh, with other generations. And so, you know, out of that, we began to think about, is that our opportunity as a senior living organization, as a retirement community, is that our place to begin to rebuild that sense of what it means to be an elder, what it means to really take everything that I've learned in my life and then actively invest that uh, in, in next generations? So with what you just said, what I, I I think you're spot on, but you know, reflecting on the comment about how we're not doing that in our culture any longer. Mm -hmm. We're not really communities anymore, right? As a culture, you know. So yeah. it's it's really hard. I, I think we live mostly as individuals now or in our very small family unit, but we don't have those larger communities. So that makes it so much harder to do. However, you have a community, and it and so the thought that you could do that, um, I I think uh, you know makes sense that that would be something to really strive for because hmm. unfortunately I do think you know for the most part we we've lost that we really have our uh, yeah. our post World War II suburban culture has failed us uh, you know yeah. and. We've, we've ended up in a place where we don't know our neighbors. You know, we drive down the street, we pull into the garage, and we don't interact with anybody around us uh, for the most part. And so uh, what we really see as the beauty of a retirement community is that opportunity to really engage, to be a hub of our larger community, and to be a place where people can connect and people can gather and people can form relationships uh, with one another. So before I jump to ask you what you've done at the employee level to, to build that culture, I know you have a great story um, that relates to what you've been doing with your residents and creating or giving them an opportunity to continue to find purpose. And I, I uh, believe you have a group that goes to Honduras oh, on yeah. a regular basis. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about that. Yeah, we started looking for opportunities. Um for purpose in our community what what are the opportunities that that we can you know kind of provide or facilitate and it really started to bubble up you know it started with things like well you know we we had a group that was interested in the environment and so uh, we connected with the chesapeake bay restoration project and so they started to go out and testing stream water in our local area and people who were concerned about uh mentoring young people and so we got them connected with a local youth center and, and on and on 
And then we had people who said, you know, I know a group that uh, that's connected with a group of churches in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and they want to build a camp, but they're not able to do it on their own. Can we go down and help them? And we said, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And so we put together and for, oh, my goodness, uh, quite a long time, uh, a, a number of years and a number of trips, we had groups of staff and residents going to a mountain outside of Tegucigalpa and teaming up with Honduran folks and Nicaraguan folks who came in to build this camp. And it is still, I just saw the director um, a couple days ago, and she said oh, it's wow. still the only camp in Honduras or in Central America that's serving with pe pe serving people with disabilities. It's become this really beautiful location where uh, people with disabilities can come and they can get that camp experience that's that's catered to around their needs, and uh, and they can live life in a more full, more vibrant way because of the work that our residents did. Um, yeah. and, and so we, we did that. And then Honduras got a little bit dicey. And, uh, and so we thought, well, maybe we need to look for some other opportunities. And so we found out about a group called Cure that does children's hospitals in developing countries. And so we teamed up with them and we had residents start to go to the Dominican Republic um, in January or February, which is not a big, uh, you know, yeah. sacrifice, uh, yeah. but they went there just to love on a bunch of kids at, at these oh, children's okay. hospitals. And then they heard about one in Kenya and they said, well, why don't we go to Kenya? And so they started going to Kenya and, uh, you know, traveling to Africa in order to, again, love on these kids and their families. And then they found out about a group that uh, does uh, schools and vocational training and microloans and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so they've teamed up with them recently as well and just continue to find opportunities around the world where people can uh, can go and, and kind of pour themselves into uh, people from other cultures where they can learn from those people, uh, from those other cultures, and uh, just creates this really rich uh, sense of experience in life. Certainly not the typical story that you think you're going to hear from someone at a senior living community. So I think that's, it's just amazing. And it, it's given us all just a different way of looking at this. So thanks for sharing those stories. Yeah. And that really is the power of culture, right? Once you get yeah. something started, it kind of takes over and it just grows and emerges and flourishes into things you never would have imagined. It does take on a life of its own. Did you ever imagine that it would grow this way for you? No, no, never at all. Yeah. Uh, in fact, yeah. I, I was reflecting on it recently and those first couple of years, you know, we made that shift and started talking about other centered lives just out of a sense of self-preservation for me, you know, because I mean, the first two years at, at Garden Spot, I had a knot in my stomach every day. It was tense. It was, you know, it was yeah. a struggle. And, and so, you know, we started thinking about how do we shift that? And then we realized it just really resonated with with people's hearts and their own sense of mission and their passion for for living. And it just blossomed into something I never could have imagined. Yeah. So that's on the resident side. Let's switch now to the employee side and the focus you had there with regards to the culture that you wanted to create and, and the second bucket of, uh, of this culture building project that you took on years ago. Yeah. Tell us some success stories there. I mean, what did you do and what ha what have you seen come from that focus and that um, building of a, a, a purposeful building of an employee culture? Yeah, well, like I said, it, it started with uh, that sense of uh, we really need to retool some things around here. And so, you know, the first and foremost, you know, at that point in time, this is 2001, uh, customer service. You know, we, we've got to get better at customer service. And uh, so that really was a starting point. And at the time, we we couldn't afford to go to Disney and learn their model of, you know, of service, which is amazing. Uh, but I contacted the Hotel Hershey, which is a five-star kind of grand old hotel. And uh, 
in conversation there, they eventually agreed to share their training program with us. And so we gathered up all of our leadership team and we went to the Hotel Hershey and they spent a day with us, uh, kind of sharing wow. the way they think about customer service and the training that they do and the systems they incorporate in order to create that five-star experience. And so that was really a starting point for us. Um, and we went on and, and began to, to build on that. We started talking about accountability and, and what does accountability mean? Um, and we realized that there's a couple different things and, and coming out of, we're a faith-based organization, uh, we're affiliated and, and have our roots in the Mennonite tradition. And so out of that tradition, there's a sense of accountability, but always to help the other person grow and develop, not just to smack somebody's hand. And so we kind of drew that out of our faith tradition and said, you know, we have an opportunity to create something different, that we we need to be accountable, uh, but it needs to be accountability focused on restoration, focused on helping uh, each other to become the best versions of ourselves. And then the other part of that is we started talking about this idea that if accountability is really going to work, if it's really going to be effective, it needs to go both directions. We need to have a sense of mutual accountability. And so as a leader, and I still share this uh, every time I have an opportunity to talk at new employee orientation, um, you know, I, I tell our team members that are just getting started here that, um, you know, that well, part of my job is to hold people accountable for the work that we have to do. We've got a large organization serving a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And so, you know, I need to hold folks accountable for the work that, that's getting done. But at the same time, uh, not, not just an invitation, but an expectation uh, that they would hold me accountable as well. So if they hear me saying something that doesn't fit with our mission or our values or our guiding principle, or if they see the organization making decisions that don't seem to fit with our vision or, or uh, you know, our, our strategic direction or, or our culture, that I would hope and, and I would expect that they would catch me in the hallway or stop by my office or give me a call and, and just say, Steve, you know, I heard you say this or I saw that the organization's doing that and, and I don't understand how that fits with who we are. Let's talk about that. And so the beauty of that is we've had those conversations over the years where people have caught me and, and it's just always enlightening and it's always helpful. Uh, to for us to be able to stay focused and stay aligned as an organization. And so that accountability is, is really, uh, really key there as, as we go forward. Um, you know, I think the accountability, as you describe it, um, you know, is tied to, at least as I think about it, so I'd love to hear your thoughts, is really tied to the conversation you had earlier about we've become this consumer society, right? We buy our solutions instead right. of taking personal accountability for them ourselves, whatever mm -hmm. it might be. You know, and some things we can't, right? Some things we do need to buy, but there are other things that we can do ourselves if we were to take that personal accountability to do so. Yeah, absolutely. And, and creating a strong culture is something that we have to do mm -hmm. for ourselves. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we're passive, then we're going to be at the whim of others. And so mm -hmm. by, by stepping into that space and uh, being a part of the solution, it helps us to build something that we can all be proud of, that we can all uh, belong in, and that we can all come to work every day feeling good about this place that we spend so many hours uh, in the course of a week. There one um, initiative that you put in place to support the employee culture. So you've got your the transparency that you tried to create and you have these monthly meetings. Um, was there anything else that you can remember putting in place that you think impacted the culture for your employees? Yeah, uh, there's a, a, just a bunch of stuff that we've done over the course of time. But um, one of those started with um, a, a, a speaker that I heard, uh, and it was Andy Stanley, who's a pastor and a leadership expert, and he was talking on leadership, and he was talking on culture. And one of the things he said that really stuck with me, uh, he said that if you don't know why it's working, when it's working, you won't know how to fix it when it's broke. 
And uh, by this point in time, we felt like we had some things that were working for us. We had turned things around a little bit in terms of culture. We had some good things that were starting to bubble up. And uh, and so um, we, we stopped and we said, do we know exactly why it's working? You know, could we put our finger on if we had to go back and fix something, uh, why, how, how to make that work? And we realized that, um, that we had some ideas about what that was looking like, but we really weren't, we didn't have a lot of clarity around that. And, gotcha. uh, and so we, we hired a group to come in that did an anthropological study of our culture. Um, and so that just gave us enormous insight in, into lots of different areas of culture and ended up being a pretty pivotal uh, point for us to continue to build and grow and, and be intentional about developing uh, that as we went forward. So um, got to ask, what is an anthropological study or or maybe more importantly, how does somebody go about doing that? Like what was involved in an anthropological study of your culture? Yeah, it's a, it's a group that comes in, um, you know, this particular group came in and, and they really work to apply anthropological theory and methods uh, to the study of an organization. And so, you know, it's all about how does culture develop and, and what is really going on under the surface and how do people really live in this space uh, and function here. And, uh, and then in an organizational environment, it's not only how do we function together, but how do we interact with our consumers? Uh, and, and so it's this idea that culture really is a, a complex set of values and meanings and practices uh, that influence our human behavior, that, that kind of result in how we do things around here. And so uh, they came in and over the course of, of several weeks, uh, they interviewed literally hundreds of our staff and residents. Um, okay. And they looked at things like, how, how do you build community here? How do you value people here? Uh, how do you display authenticity in your relationships with one another? Uh, what does leadership look like in this environment? And, and are you sharing leadership? Uh, you know, and, and all of those kind of key questions uh, that went into, um, into the sense of culture um, and then produced, you know, tens of pages of, of reports sure. you know, that, yeah. that we were able to go through and, and dig into. Uh, but one of the fascinating things, and when they came in, uh, our request to them was that they not just interview staff, but interview residents as well. And, uh, and so uh, they said, well, we've never had that request. Are you sure that's what you want? And we said, no, it really is. We want to understand, you know, kind of the full uh, scope of, of culture. And they came out of that saying, you know, we were really surprised um, that you really have one culture. It's not a separate workplace culture and it's not a separate resident culture, but it really is integrated. And uh, and we realized that a lot of those things that we had been talking about over the years had been directed to both residents and staff. And so it had taken root and those stories that we were telling had had uh, an impact on everyone. And so those cultures kind of came together and integrated, they knit together uh, to create one community where we have you know, folks who live here and folks who work here and folks who visit here. Uh, and so it, it was really encouraging in that respect. Um, but it really, as I said, it became that that uh, that kind of foundation that we could build on, that we could continue to be intentional about a lot of the other things that that we began to implement and to develop. So I love that while you thought you took a three bucket approach to building your culture, right? In the end, you created one culture for both the residents and the employees. And I know as we've talked now and, and you and I've talked before, purpose is so huge and, and really just probably the driving factor behind your mm -hmm. culture and why it is the way it is. So when you think about purpose as it relates to your employees how is there something that you can say that you've done that's helped your employees to find that sense of purpose yeah we we think um that purpose is, is key and uh probably even more in, important in the environment that 
we find ourselves in now. Mm -hmm. uh, young people coming into the workforce don't just want a job you know, that pays the bills. Uh, they want to be engaged with some, a purpose, uh, with something bigger than themselves. And, and, and so um, we've really worked on articulating that, what that looks like, how we explore that together. Uh, we always try and connect the dots uh, to the bigger purpose uh, that we have starts at, at our orientation process, which we have uh, now expanded to instead of we started with one day, then we went to three days, and now we spread that over three months uh, with oh, wow. lots of different opportunities to connect. And, and actually, residents are involved in that orientation of new employees, too, again, leading to that one culture. And really, it gives people an opportunity to understand the potential for their impact. Uh, you know, we, we live in a culture, we, we t alluded to that earlier, that really marginalizes older adults, that, that puts, you know, older adults to the side. And, um, and so we see that as an opportunity to live purpose-filled lives as staff, that we can come alongside people, that we can uh, encourage them and help them and facilitate opportunities for them to become the best version of themselves, regardless of whether they're living in one of our cottages or apartments and still holding down a job, or whether they're, uh, you know, have a lot of medical is issues and frailty and live in skilled nursing. Uh, you know, there's opportunities for us to create a sense of purpose in their lives. And in doing that and thinking about that, uh, it just it gives us that that sense that when we go home every night, we've accomplished something. Um, there was a great one of the ways I knew that was starting to work is a number of years ago, uh, we had a, a woman who worked in our laundry uh, who had been there for a number of years. She had announced to her supervisor that she was retiring, uh, you know, that her body just couldn't take the physical nature of the work anymore. Uh, and she said something that was that I'll, I'll never forget. She told him, she said, now, you don't have to worry about finding a replacement for me. She said, I've already started interviewing for that. And I'm finding the right person because this job is just too important to leave it up to chance that you're going to find the right person, which I absolutely love. It's that sense that what I'm doing in the laundry every day is having such an impact on people that that. I can't leave here without knowing it's in good hands. Uh, and, and so uh, that sense of, of connection uh, to purpose is really important. And then there's a couple yeah, other things. Also, if you, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say there's also that personal accountability for what she was doing and the right. role that she played within your organization. Like she owned that. Oh, totally. I mean, that's what I'm getting from that story, right? So that's huge. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And, and so. All right. So you were, you were going to tell another story. I don't want to. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say that <laughs> that's kind of one part of our approach to that. Uh, we had done some uh, some learning around self-determination theory that came out of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and other research that was going. And uh, and we, we really feel strongly that there's four key areas uh, that, that people need to really be motivated when they come to work every day to, to have that sense of connectedness. And it's uh, mastery, autonomy, purpose, and relationship. And so we talked about purpose. Mastery is just that sense of, I wanna continue to learn and grow and get better at the things that matter to me. Uh, autonomy is that sense that I have a voice, uh, that, that my being here matters and I can help to shape the environment in which I work every day and the, and the way that we serve people uh, here. Um, and then relationship. We all want to be respected. We all want to be connected with other people. We all want a place where we can belong, uh, where we can love others and be loved by others. And, and so, you know, that kind of all rolls together in with that sense of purpose to really try to create uh, an environment that, that people are pleased to come to work, that they feel that sense of ownership and a sense of pride in what they do every day. So let me ask, based on all of that, um, because what you're talking about are, you know, when we when we talk about employee engagement, we're talking about doing the very things that you just mentioned, right? Creating those opportunities for mastery, for connection, for purpose, mm -hmm. uh, for autonomy. So what does employee engagement look like at Garden Spot? Or maybe even an easier one to answer, what does retention look like? Yeah, we had um 
really good retention until COVID. <laughs> I will say yeah. uh, we have we have suffered coming out of yeah. COVID in the same way that yeah. so many others have. Uh, but I will say, even through that process, and and COVID was just brutal uh, in a senior living organization in a retirement community uh, because you know yeah. it, it was our residents that that um, that kind of targeted and had the most impact on. And, and it was devastating, uh, you know, in, in the lives of people and in our community. And so the fact that our staff stuck that out um, the, all the way through, uh, we had very little turnover uh, during COVID. Uh, but as we came to the end of it, uh, you know, people said, I'm just exhausted. You know, I, it's just been emotionally draining. It's been physically draining. And, and I need to step away, not just from this role, but from healthcare in general. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we did have, and there was, you know, the, the, everybody was quitting at that point in time. And there were posts out on social media, if you haven't quit your job, you're missing an opportunity kind of thing. And so, right. uh, so we dipped that and, and we're on, we're on our way back, uh, which I think is, is the positive impact of culture is that we're, we're kind of our, uh, retention rates are, uh, coming back up. We're not quite to where we were before, but we're making a lot of headway and getting close again. Go on forever, and I think we should have you back to talk about re rebuilding culture. Because, mm -hmm. as you know, right now you're going, you're turning over. You've got new employees coming in. Some of those things that were moving and grooving for you before, you probably have to now kind of be more purposeful with them again to mm -hmm. to make sure that with as the new employees come in, right, that you you maintain that culture that you had built and created over time. So that yeah. could be like part two. We could do that on another podcast. Talk there about you how you're doing with that. Um, but I did just want to ask, do you remember the book, the Peter Block book yeah. that you referenced earlier? The most recent one that he's written, and he's written a bunch of them. I don't remember the titles of all of them. But the most recent is called Activating the Common Good. And okay. uh, it's just a, a great read. And he goes on. He kind of builds on his approach and then talks about this culture of professionalism that we've developed where if something in our community isn't going well, then somebody needs to be fired from their job uh, and replaced. And, and so I think that is just a, a really nice way of kind of rounding that out and uh, and thinking about how we respond to that in our organizations. You know, how do we create a sense of community and accountability and, and a culture where we're solving our own challenges. Yeah, that's huge. So I have a book recommendation for you. You may have already read it, but listening to you talk, um, I'm thinking you might like a book called Tribe on Homecoming and, Be and Belonging. Yes, I know that book. I have that on my yes. shelf. It is a really good one. It's a, yeah, it's an amazing book. I really loved it. I recommend it to almost everyone I talk to when we get into conversations mm -hmm. uh, like what you and I are having, right, about culture, but also about belonging and purpose. And so for all of my listeners here, it's Tribe on Homecomings and Belonging by Sebastian Younger. And I mm -hmm. believe that's J-U-N-G-E-R. Highly recommend it. Not very long. Really, I thought, a great read. So, um, yeah. so Steve... Go ahead. I was just going to say, throw one more book into the conversation. Yeah, go for uh, one it. One that's been pivotal for us over the last uh, year or so. It's called Brave New Work by Aaron Dignan. And uh, okay. it's on reshaping your workplace culture for this new environment in which we live now. Uh, so I would highly recommend that as well. It really has guided our initial steps into more of a distributed leadership effort that we have uh, dug into in, in the last year. So Brave New Work? Brave New Work, yeah. By, and who was the author? Aaron Dignan. Okay, awesome. All right, so I'm going to wrap this up, but I do want to just ask you one last question. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a question I like to ask everybody, and that is, what is something um, that is so oh, how's my question go all right i'm going to i'm going to come up with a new one for you steve <laughs> okay. what's next for you if there's you know what's the the one next thing that you want to tackle you've done so much already but is there what what's uh, in the future 
Yeah, I'll tell you that the thing that we're really grinding away on right now and that I would love to create more and better solutions to is intergenerational connection. Uh, that sense of bringing people together across generations. Um, Stanford Center for Longevity produced a white paper just a, a year or two ago. And one of the things they said in that was that at the beginning of the 20th century, the United States was one of the most age integrated cultures in the world. But by the end of that same century, by the year 2000, we were the most age segregated. And we've lost so much as a result of that. So we're thinking about how do we create environments that bring people together? We started a couple courses with two different colleges that team up uh, elders and, and college freshmen together for a semester long course. Uh, we're thinking about living environments. How can we create living environments that intentionally bring people of different generations together to share life, to share community, and to learn and grow from each other? Wow, that sounds amazing. So that could also be something that we discuss the next time we have you back on the show, because I would definitely love to have you back and just continue to hear about what you're doing at Garden Spot Communities. So yeah. Steve, thank you so much. This has been amazing. I really enjoyed our conversation. I believe our listeners will enjoy it as well. Um, thanks again for your time. Thank you. It's such a privilege to be able to share a little bit of our story. So I, I thank you for giving me that opportunity. Mm -hmm.